Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, see how to get started with design basics from the ground up. On tour, visit a young couple who renovated a trample yard with flowers, fruit, and chickens. Daphne answers your top question and makes her pick of the week. And John Dromgul has your backyard basic tips. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. As I know from my own experience, starting a garden from scratch is a creative and rewarding adventure. See how this young couple renovated a trampled yard with flowers, food, and chickens. Building a home for chickens wasn't the first project on the list when Molly O'Halloran and David Brearley bought a house dating from 1915 on Austin's east side. In my memory, it was Dave's idea, and in his memory, it was my idea, so we must have, <laughs> we must have both wanted chickens. <laughs> Well, it, it's living in the neighborhood because uh, you hear, like you hear roosters in the morning, you hear roosters right, <laughs> right now, now. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and, and then you we, see them and we'd be walking the alleys or, and or stuff like that. Or loose chickens in some, in some, some cases, areas. Literally feral chickens. They're beautiful. And uh, yeah, so we, uh, and then we saw them at Callahan's and, and uh, like I said, it was Molly's idea to get some chickens. <laughs> but restoring their coop came first especially its front yard on high impact deadline. We were getting married within a year of moving to Austin and we were going to have the, the wedding kind of in the neighborhood. We were going to have a wedding party, like a, a party at the house. So we needed to do something sort of in a hurry. With yards of decomposed granite, walkways and new plants, they spared their guests the before picture. And then the front and backyards were basically, uh, you know, dirt. Uh, people used to park their cars and, and you know, work on their cars in the front yard. Um, uh, so, so we're pretty much starting from scratch. We built some berms in the front for cactus just because everything was so flat and monochromatic. Um, and, and we didn't want to have to pay to haul off extra dirt that we had on true. the property. So we mounded things up and that's why the cactus are doing so nicely in the front. As time went by, they added more water-wise plants, bypassing monochromatic with textural heights that define but don't hinder, and distinctive attention that doesn't suffocate the house with clutter. It wasn't until maybe three years ago that we put the vegetable patch in the front and it's just because in the winter the backyard gets plenty of sun but in the summer um, the pecans shade, shade most things out so this is, got started for a summer tomato and pepper patch but now it's a full year garden, vegetable garden. In back their vegetable bed borders the chicken run. Molly and David throw wilted leaves and weeds to eager beaks for instant composting. For the dog, there's a miniature lawn planted on mounded soil they dug out to relieve a drainage issue. Part of it is uh, to deal with kind of water on the lot, which is it's a flat lot, so when we get those Texas-style rains, you got to have some place to, to put that water. So we have a trench drain system in the back to kind of feeds water back over towards the pecan tree and then um, and then and that's how we wound up with the raised lawn area because that was overburdened that we took out of the trench drain system <laughs> and then uh, and then I just sort of had this you know came up with this plan to kind of have a little uh, patio and a bench and kind of that water feature the pergola kind of on off the side of the shed Makes a nice path from the house out to the chicken coop. And eventually we'll have a, like a, a back deck coming off of the house. So you'll come out the house to the back deck, step down to the lawn, and then kind of step down to the path. Doing the work themselves, they rely on recycled materials for most of it.
the restore. We go to the restore all, all the, time. the time. Our chicken coops. All the shed got Pretty built much. out of the restore. And the, the chicken, chicken coop, coop entirely from the restore. Yeah. Recycled, um, galvanized metal and all the lumber. But all structures, including the chicken coop, get new materials to roof them. When they added chickens to the family, the first step was to secure the fence to keep out stray dogs. Since predators of all types are the biggest challenge, they finessed the chicken coop and the chicken run. So we dug down uh, around the, when we were building the coop, you know, we dug trenches all around the perimeter and buried hardware Hard. cloth quarter inch, quarter inch, I think. Well, it's maybe, cloth. yeah, it doesn't have to so be super tight. So things can't burrow there. in. And then you'll see that two sides of the coop are open to the air, but they're double wrapped with chicken wires, so things can't crawl in And hardware cloth, way. yeah. But it's um, ventilated really well. We did have to protect them from the hawks. That were, when the leaves would come off the trees, the hawks would see the birds and then they would try to land in the backyard. So we put up a bird netting. An automatic coop door on a carefully set timer comes in handy if Molly and David must be away at roosting time. The chickens pay for the room and board as compost turners. The bins are kind of wrapped with hardware cloth, but they're open to the front. So you can kind of mound stuff up and the chickens will get in there and kind of pull it down and scratch it out. And then, uh, and, uh, and essentially they're kind of mixing the compost for you, doing, doing the work that like we wouldn't do, to be honest. Yeah, you know? and, it's uh, uh, getting and then turned we... much better with the open fronts than it ever was before. And then, uh, and then at certain times of the year, they get to come out and you know scratch around the backyard and in the lawn and kind of in the remnants of the garden. Into that we let them out for little vacations so they can when we're between garden seasons or like if we something like that. Cover crop. We started doing cover crops a little bit more this year. So in between kind of plantings in the garden, and so then. You know, at some point you want to turn that cover crop in and it's great to let the chickens out there and have them kind of give, give them the first go at it. Because they love to just, you know, peck and scratch and stuff and, you know, eat green leaves. What they eat makes a difference in the eggs that Molly and David will never have to buy again. When they're sort of in their prime, like we have six chickens and we were having way more eggs than we could eat between the two of us. We were giving eggs to one of our neighbors who's since got chickens herself and uh, and and we did a like a eggs for art exchange. <laughs> She's a painter. And and, uh, we, we got yeah. a painting. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's very a, generous uh, from her end, I think. Yeah. And uh, but they're good eggs. I mean, they're qualitatively better than the than the eggs, even the you know the organic pasture fed eggs that you get. Oh, at they're the so store. good, and you can tell. I mean, even in with our same chickens, you can tell from season to season by the eggs what they're eating. So in the in this time of year and all through the winter when they're getting lots of greens from the garden, the eggs get really um, orange colored and uh, very rich. And then in the summer when they're, we don't garden much in the summer and when, when they're eating mostly corn, the yolks get more pale. And uh, so it's, inter it's really interesting to see, you know, what they're eating affects what you're eating, of course. Winter can be in a slowdown in production. They like the cooler weather, but the shorter days can also trigger um, uh, a molting response where they, they actually, it's one of the ways nature kind of wins out over our attempts to kind of breed them and to be egg producers is they want to like shed all of their feathers so that they can fly south. You know? <laughs> and so the body goes, it, when they're shedding, when they're molting, you know, so the body's resources are going to replace their feathers instead of give you eggs. And as pets, they're pretty low maintenance. They, uh, you know, they're they sort of know everything they need to know at one day old. I mean, they know how to scratch and peck, and that sort of gets them through life very successfully. Precocious in their antics and distinct in personality, Molly and David's chickens supply lots more than eggs. I find them relaxing. It's uh, 
It's nice to look out the window and watch them. It's nice to sit out with them. They're, I like their sounds. Um, when you're working in the garden or raking, like they get really excited when they see a rake come out because it's yeah. stirring stuff up, the bugs and worms. They love to eat when we find grubs or anything. They love to, we call them over and they come running for the grubs. They're, they're funny. Uh, it just adds a nice a touch of energy and humor to, to the, the place, I think. Thank you, Molly and David. They have a fabulous garden, and I love what they've done with their energy, their passion, their creativity. They found their own groove in their garden world, and I thank them very much. I'm Linda Lemisverda. I'm producer of Central Texas Gardener, standing in for Tom Spencer today. And like most of you, or all of us out there, I was once a gardener who looked at the yard, and I didn't know what I had in it, didn't know what kind of grass, it was weeds really, and I didn't know where to get started or what to do. So today I'm joined by an expert, Diana Kirby of Diana's Designs. Diana is a master gardener, a landscape designer, and a garden coach. Really, it is so fabulous to have you with us today. Thanks for having me. And so, as a gardener yourself who started what? How did you start, first of all? I started with just a few little annuals in the garden for a little color, and it just grew from there as a passion that developed over the years, and, and now it's what I do for a living. So I, I feel very fortunate that I can do that. Yes. And so what are the things, if, if you could look back in the Diana that started a few years ago and say, Diana, this is what you need to do first, what would you say to yourself? I would say for new gardeners, it's important to plan. Even though you may only have a budget to do a small bed or a corner somewhere, think about your whole yard in toto. Think about the trees that you want to put in, what kind of space you want to have. Do you want to have an entertaining space or do you want to have a quiet place to sit and read a book? Do you have children who need some playroom or dogs that need room to run? Think about what you want to accomplish with your garden and then do some planning. The planning is the hardest thing. Um, even now, and I know better, and I still make the mistake, you get this little tree that's, you know, like this or this little thing. You really have to look into the future because you plant this tree and in 10 years it's going to be significant shade. And if you wanted to have a vegetable garden or say you're thinking you were going to have a pool someday, um, that could be a problem. And so these days it's very easy to find out sizes, especially with Google and Central Texas Gardener's plant list. But what are some of the other things people need to think about? We've got size, but what else? People need to think about amending their soil so they have good soil for plants to grow and they need to consider the full size when the plants mature. They also need to look at their sun needs and their water needs and try to group plants together accordingly so that the same plants in the same bed have identical needs so that you can care for them in the same way. And that sounds so easy, but do you know recently I met a gardener who's very experienced actually, and they were still kind of thinking of the lessons their mother maybe had passed along, and the idea of grouping plants by water needs was not really an issue at one time so right. much, I, except that if it doesn't need much water and you put it with something that needs a lot of water, it's going to rot. Right. And you've always got to be flexible. I know I started out with sun and planted for sunny things, planted my little tree, and now that area's in shade. So you have to be right. willing to you adapt. You have to plan ahead. It's good to, to, when you do your plan, you can sketch it out on a piece of paper. You can take out a garden hose and line out where you might want to have a bed. Think about things like where the shade is now or where it's going to be in a few years. Um, and think about the plants that you like and what you want to put in there. The other thing they can do is make drawings. And I love going back to my first little garden diary. That's the other, and you know, you're a journalist too, is document every step of the way. Because five years from now, you may not believe this, but five years from now, you're, this is like your family album. I mean, this is as important as a child or, or a pet, is how your garden grows, and it reflects a lot about you. But I have, you know, I make my kind of sloppy little designs and go out with pots and stuff. What is it that you recommend to really kind of get a better handle of sizing of, of your space? Well, it's good to measure. And when you go to the, your independent nursery, talk to them about how big the plants will get um, and how plants can be grouped together. But what you do is take your survey, right, your house right. survey, right. and you can kind of do it like that. And so that gives you a better, right. kind of a better sense of that. And because I know for you, the way you started out was um, before you were going to have a child, you knew you were going to plan a playscape. 
I did. I left room in the landscape for a playscape, and I planned uh, pretty beds, pretty garden beds all around it to kind of soften it and make it attractive for me. But I knew that we needed that playscape in there. Now, the other thing is people see so many garden designs, and they can feel overwhelmed. I know that you recommend, you know, getting pictures out of magazines and other things. You see something that catches your eye, the way you would do for furniture in your interior of a house. But what is it that they need to think about in the big scheme of it, who they are? There are, there are a few things that are great to, to use as guidelines going in. Think about your personal style. Do you like clean contemporary lines? Do you like simplistic, minimalist style in your home? then you might prefer a, a cleaner look, a more formal look with simple hedges that are trimmed and pruned and things that are more symmetrical. If you like things a little more eclectic or you have a more free-flowing style, you might look at plants that are um, have long arching branches and flowing feel or soft grasses that billow in the breeze. You might also be more interested in an asymmetrical style. Instead of straight lines in the beds, you might want a lot of curved lines and natural feel to the space that you that you develop. But in either style, or you know whatever style you prefer, what is it that kind of helps direct your eye? When I started, I was oh I want a bunch of this and I'm gonna have a bunch of that and we're gonna do this and gonna do that. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you walk out and it's like where do, where am I going? What direction am I going in? So what do you reckon? What's an inexpensive thing without hiring a landscape architect and doing all that? It's easy to have a hodgepodge in your garden when you love plants and you like to put them in there. But it's important to think about having a focal point. You can do that very simply and inexpensively with a pretty pot, with a bird bath, or maybe it's even a plant that's a big sculptural plant, like maybe an agave on the corner of a bed, that helps direct the eye, make something a focal point of the garden, and make your landscape bed much more cohesive so that everything um, uh, works off of each other. And sometimes this can be as simple as finding something crazy at a thrift store. It doesn't even have to be expensive. Sure. And that's where it brings your personality into that's it. That's right. It can reflect your personal style. It can yeah. be something shabby chic that you pick up at a flea market um, or some piece of garden art that you bought at an expensive gallery. I mean, it, it, really is, it really depends on whatever your personal taste is to make it your own personal garden. Now, what do you say about color? Um, do you like the idea of matching to your house? Do you have one kind of color, you know, like the Gertrude Schickel white garden, or do you just get what you want? I think you need, again, to think about what you like. You can look to your personal style inside the house, too, and see what, what really right inspires idea. you. But you should consider the style and the color of your house. Um, but there are a lot of different ways to go. You can go with a monochromatic style, where you have some of the same hues of the same color um, to keep it kind of soft and delicate in the garden, or you can have bright pops of color, which look great in our hot sunny gardens here, by looking um, at a color wheel and looking at the colors that are across from one another on the wheel or that form um, a triangle on the wheel to see which colors work best with one another and show each other's off to their best advantage. Now, for people who maybe don't want to have a landscape designer, what is a garden coach? What, is, what do you do as a garden coach? When I coach, I go into someone's landscape and I listen to them talk about their goals and their expectations, what kind of style they like, and I help them think about what would look good. You know, maybe there's a, a nice spot for a tree over here, or maybe we need some ground cover. Um, I try to help give them a vision of what their garden could be based on what they tell me they'd like to see in their garden. Um, I do a little sketch, I list some plants, I give them information where they can ask personal questions, simple questions that they might not be able to do um, in a nursery or information they might not be able to get out of a book. And then if they wanted to do a landscape design, just very quickly, they can get just a drawing or they can get they can, design they and can installation? Get, they can get a design by itself and do it themselves and they can do it over time or they can have us do the whole installation for them, um, or okay. even do it in phases. It really depends on each individual person's need and budget. And how can they get in touch with you? They can contact me through my website at dianasdesignsaustin.com, or they can check out my blog at sharingnaturesgarden.blogspot.com. Well, thanks a lot, Diana. You've encouraged me to go out and fix some mistakes in my own <laughs> garden. But right now, let's check in with our friend, Daphne Richards. 
I'm Daphne Richards. Our question this week is, what's the difference between soil, compost, and mulch? Well, they're all used in similar ways and have a lot to contribute to our gardens. We could spend days discussing and defining soil, but one good way to think of it is the substrate that your plants grow in. Soil is made up of varying amounts of sand, silt, and clay. And if you've got a good balance of these three mineral elements, your soil is called loam. Too much clay leads to sticky, heavy soil that inhibits plant growth, and too much sand leads to leaching and a lack of water holding capacity. Silt somewhere in between clay and sand as far as size, texture, and effect on overall soil structure. If you're lucky, your soil also has a good amount of organic matter and a healthy microbial population. But you might be surprised to learn that a soil with only 5% organic matter is pretty fabulous and it's hard to get even that much into your soil. Compost is pretty much all organic matter, depending on the ingredients that went into it. Grass clippings, leaves, and kitchen scraps normally. And maybe a little bit of soil if you've added some from your garden, which would be a good thing, since your soil contains the necessary microbes to break down the organic matter in your compost pile to a size and texture that's beneficial in your soil. Compost helps to increase the water holding capacity of your soil without overdoing it. It helps to break up heavy clay soils and helps sandy soils hold a bit more water. It builds the structure of your soil, giving it just the right balance of air and water. Compost also feeds the microbial population, helping to keep them around and contributing to your overall soil health. And mulch is ground up plant parts that are not composted and are generally larger pieces than compost. Prune tree limbs that have been processed with a chipper shredder, bark pieces, and even processing byproducts such as pecan shells and cocoa holes can be used as mulch. Mulch is generally all carbon as opposed to compost, which contains both carbon and nitrogen. Compost may also be used as a mulch since the primary purpose of mulch is to protect the soil from the environment by covering it. Both compost and mulch eventually break down due to the weather and the action of microbes, which is why it should be replenished at least yearly. Our plant this week is a Salvia gregii cultivar known as Cardinal Velvet. This particular Salvia gregii cultivar behaves much the same as the species, but the flowers have a more intensely velvety look to them. The flower is a little fuzzier, which gives it a different texture and a deeper color. Although it's a low water use plant, it will definitely perform a little better if you water it once a week during the heat of summer. Flowers from spring right on through fall with maybe a little break in the peak of the summer heat. Gets about three feet tall by three feet wide. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions or plants of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with John Dromgold for Backyard Basics. Hello, gardening friends. Welcome to Backyard Basics. You want to grow compost in your own yard? You ever heard of cover crops? The farmers use cover crops quite a bit. The organic farmer does too. And so um, this is a tremendous way to build the soil. It also uh, acts like a living mulch out there. It keeps the sun off of it. It stops the uh, soil from just baking. It's frequently used in the winter time. Uh, there are some crops for uh, spring and for summer, but these are some of the winter crops. And uh, most of these are legumes. And these legumes fix nitrogen directly from the air. You're getting free nitrogen out in the garden. And so, um, and that cover crop also is, like I said, compost. You're just going to turn it in. So you, uh, this is Austrian winter pea right here. It's a really nice one, easy to use. You basically broadcast it out there. You need good seed soil contact. You turn the soil a bit, and then you just broadcast it in there. It doesn't need to be in rows or added by hand. It's very simple to do. Austrian winter pea is a good looking one out in the garden. And if you're going to put it to sleep for the winter, and many people do, then um, you would use one of these cover crops. Um, here's another one called vetch. You may have heard of vetch. It's a rank grower, just a big old plant, lots of organic matter, beautiful little flowers, and uh, another one that fixes a lot of nitrogen. You know, these guys, in order to fix nitrogen, need to be inoculated. And so this inoculant that we use out here is used specifically on different kinds, actually. And this will then um, allow it to fix even more nitrogen than it would naturally. And I like this big growth that they put on. You know, here's one that's really nice. This is uh, clover, crimson clover. This is a nice little clumping plant. You can use it out in the garden. And as spring comes around, 
beautiful red flowers on it, just gorgeous red flowers. Some of the folks that uh, use a lot of herbs use a red clover blossom as a blood purifier. Uh, check it out some more, make sure that I'm right, but uh, it's used in that way. And so uh, this is another beautiful one to put out in the garden, fixing a lot of nitrogen in the soil, a massive org amount of organic matter. Before these things really get off into their bloom cycle, um, you can cut them off and let them dry a little bit, lay on the soil, and then you work it in there. And it helps to hold that nitrogen in place and actually builds that tremendous soil of ours. Um, here's one that uh, many folks will use. This is Elbon rye. One of the benefits of Elbon is it gets to be a great big old plant, bigger than any of these, and it helps control nematodes. We have nematode problems here and there, and the Elbon rye is one that does that. You need to till it in rather quickly, though, because uh, if it gets too big, it's hard to till in. So there's some ideas for you. If you're putting your garden to uh, sleep or a portion of it during the wintertime, these are the exact plants and seeds that you might use out in your garden. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgoul. I'll see you next week. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and check out our Facebook page, too. Next week, take a look at ground covers. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.